this time I'd like to introduce uh, from Emory University, Dr. Stephen Trainellis is going to speak with us. So. Um, so it's it's really uh, great to be here, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you. Uh, I learn a lot from these events. I'm not just here to tell you about what we're up to, but um, I find it really valuable to connect and hear real-world stories about the folks that we work to um, try to understand. And a couple of uh, comments about uh, the presentation before I start. Uh, my, I'm, I'm at the Department of Pharmacology, but I'm also associated with the Center for Functional Evaluation of Rare Variants at Emory. We have two of those uh, individuals who work with me, Hong Jae Yuan and Scott Myers in the back work closely. So although I'm talking, they do an equal amount of work, if not more. And so I just wanted to recognize, recognize those. Um, the other thing is that um, I need to tell you my disclosures. I am a co-founder of a small company. I receive some royalties for software, uh, consult and receive grants from various, um, various companies, Janssen and the Scientific Advisory Board of SAGE. Uh, I think the most important slide, though, for this group is I want you to recognize I'm a parent first. And so although I can't really understand what you're all going through, I have empathy. I know what it's like to have, have uh, children. Uh, I know what it's like to have uh, challenges with your children. <laughs> and so that's my first role. And, and the reason I put this up is I want to be accessible. And so I've talked with Liz a number of times. Uh, there's no reason you can't contact me. I answer my email. If I don't answer my email, contact me again. It just means it rolled off the screen and I got busy. Uh, so if there's ever anything that we can do or you see, see things on our website or you have questions, um, we're not inaccessible. And so I just want to make that point. I think the group here is, is really doing a terrific job connecting and the comments uh, in the introduction and, and, and leading up about the trajectory of organization I think are true. It seems like you guys are really moving in a good direction and we want to help out and be accessible. So the other point about this presentation is um, I, I'd like to think it's informal uh, when I, uh, despite the tie. Um, when I give my lectures to the students, I always tell them the more questions you ask, the less material we have on the test. And so. You know, a conversation is better than me standing and giving a monologue. And so please raise your hands and, and let me know. And, and Phil, please tell me when I'm running late. Give me, give me a couple minute warning. Um, and, and so I have a number of slides. We do not need to get through them all. A uh, few points I want to make, but you know, feel free if there's uh, things you want to talk about. So I just have some background here, um, and many of you know this, but just to synchronize our thinking, let's just talk a little bit about the brain and then, and then move into grin 2 b and talk about what we do and, and our perspective on things. Um, I think, as you know, uh, the brain, a central feature of the brain is really the connection between the neurons. We call these synapses. Uh, there are synapses that can excite uh, the partner they talk to and synapses that can quiet that partner. Uh, the synaptic density is, uh, is a eye-popping number, one trillion connections per cubic millimeter. You think how big your brain is, and then you go back and think about how many transistors you've read are on an Intel or an AMD chip. Um, this this uh, organ has that beat hands down many, many times over. And that also, while interesting, really uh, encapsulates the problem we have. The brain is really complex. There's a trillion connections. Uh, in that cubic millimeter, more than half, maybe 80%, might have the Grin family genes, uh, a large number of Grin 2B, and, and that's replicated in all these different regions. And so the brain is a really complicated organ, and, and it's a challenge. Um, we tend to break down from the circuit down to the level. This is a cartoon of one connection. We call this an axon, uh, a, a terminal, these little yellow dots are vesicles filled with glutamate, the transmitter, and when this neuron decides to talk to the next neuron, those, that glutamate is released and it binds to these NMDA receptors encoded by your GRIN genes. Uh, so glutamate is a transmitter, uh, and when that, uh, when that binds to the receptors made by the GRIN genes, they basically allow electrical current to flow into the cell. And if you could step back and imagine what do those machines look like, they look like a small cylinder embedded into the membrane of a cell, and the cell uh, organizes its electricity so that it's negative on the inside, every time that cylinder opens, uh, positive charge flows in, and that's basically 
the job of these grins to be the gatekeepers of when positive charge flows in. And they have some other tasks. That allows the creation of a circuit, and the circuits is what drives the basis of thought, cognition, as well as all the symptoms that we, we heard about earlier in a nice talk from Jennifer. This is what it really looks like in real life. Here's my cartoon. This is an electron micrograph. This right here is a nerve terminal. These little circles are filled with glutamate, probably 5,000 molecules of glutamate uh, per vesicle. And then this dark material here is a large, uh, a large connection of proteins, and embedded in that are the products of the Grin genes, the NMDA receptors. And so in here are the little cylinders that you can't see that will respond to the glutamate, and they will allow the current to flow into this uh, second cell. So there are, a number of, uh, there are a number of genes encoding these NMDA receptors. There's GRIN1, GRIN2A, B, C, or D. There's GRIN3A and 3B, not very well understood. Uh, these receptors are important for all sorts of things. Uh, this excitatory transmission that I just told you about, uh, best known, though, for their role in promoting plasticity. And plasticity uh, refers to the ability of the system to change and the ability of the circuits to get stronger, to get weaker, to reorganize to uh, change the pattern with which they connect. And that really allows us to think and remember, adapt and change to uh, overcome challenges for a stroke patient to learn how to move their arm again. That synaptic plasticity really allows the circuit to become what it needs to be to do the job it needs to do. And the NMDA receptors are really central in being a trigger point for those circuits to have that plasticity in the NMDA receptors. Um, it's also involved in neuronal development, and in particular, for many decades, people have argued that the GRIN2B gene product throughout life plays key roles in telling certain neurons, you know, how to connect, how strong to connect, where to migrate to, and so it has a large, uh, has an important role in development. And then these receptors have been discussed uh, in the context of lots and lots of neurological diseases, independent of of genetic uh, genetic origins. <clears throat> So this is just a picture of a timeline of when, when these GRIN2B genes are, are uh, developed, where they're, when they're present in development. So here I have, this is from a rat, I have the age of the rat, P1, P7, P14, this is early life, this would correspond to early life for humans. I've put out uh, GRIN1, GRIN2A, GRIN2B, GRIN2C, GRIN2D, and what you see is that GRIN2B is up, and in, in this is a... This is a film developed from a probe that lights up and becomes white when GRIN2B is present in the brain. And so early in life, at the very earliest time points that we measure, uh, GRIN2B is present. It's present um, all the way in the cortex and all the way through to adulthood. And you can see 2A, GRIN2A starts at very low levels or absent, but then gradually grows. And what you see in the end, for example, in this adult is GRIN1, GRIN2A, and GRIN2B have an overlapping expression. And these all form the same complex. And so there's a, there's, there's a, uh, there's a reason that the brain puts them in the same place. They really make uh, the NMD receptor, and I'm gonna show you a little bit about that. So, so these receptors are their tetrameric assemblies. This, this cylinder I told you about uh, has four parts that make it. And there are two GRIN1s, and I'm just going to informally point the pointers down. So there, there are two of these GRIN1s and two of these GRIN2s in every single NMDA receptor that's, that's in the body. And, and so what that means is that the, Grin, uh, the GRIN2B uh, variations you see are going to impact the same receptor complex that the GRIN1 variants are going to impact, and in some cases even the GRIN2As. And so I think an important point for the group to understand is that these GRIN2Bs do not operate in isolation. They are part of a complex, and so there are many similarities, although differences, between the other GRIN variants. Uh, now, the GRIN genes are, are uh, what we call highly intolerant, and GRIN2B is one of the least tolerant. And so there was a question in the, um, early on, what about lots of other variations that these laboratories find in individuals in GRIN2B? Do we know about those? Uh, how about the possibility that many people have variations and are perfectly healthy? And that information is rolling from multiple sources to a couple of places. The Broad Institute tabulates that information, and there's about 140,000 uh, so-called healthy patients who have been sequenced, and we can look at variation, and there is lots of variation in the GRIN2B gene. So not every variant in the GRIN2B gene is going to cause 
potential problems with the CNS, that some of those variations occur, but they, they occur in a part of the receptor that's not really critical. Uh, we can look at that variation, and we can see for some genes, like GRIN2B, although there is a lot of variation, there's less than the other, the other 20,000 genes in the body. And so while there is variation, it tends to be less tolerant to variation. And if you look, GRIN2A is right up there with it. Uh, and GRIN1 is also very intolerant. And so this is, you know, one of the least tolerant genes in the body. And that's why when you do have variants, they, they have the capacity to create problems with how the central nervous system works. Uh, but, it's, but these genes, I guess the point here is, it's not a given that if there is variation in that gene, it's going to cause a problem in either how that receptor functions or in how the patient operates. <clears throat> This is a picture of what the gene looks like. We have these fabulous x-ray studies that are very sophisticated where proteins are purified, placed in front of an x-ray beam on a synchrotron. Uh, diffraction patterns are collected and mathematically you can reconstruct a picture at, at the atomic level of what this receptor looks like. So we know what GRIN2B looks like. GRIN2B was actually the very first NMDA receptor that was crystallized. And it has these different domains. This is the cylinder that I told you about. There's a bunch of uh, helical rods that, that surround a central pore. And so the ions, the current flow, works its way through here and runs down a hole right down the middle there into the cell. About 50 million ions uh, per second go down that cell. And then this protein has these other really large portions. It has this you know, large set of uh, clamshells. You can't, you can't quite see them in that image, but they, they literally look like a clamshell domain. They're distal to the membrane. It has more clamshells where glutamate binds and glycine binds, uh, and they're all connected with these linkers. <clears throat> so this is 2014 data, so relatively new, but the pace at which we're understanding what these things look like and how they operate is moving at a very fast pace, and so that is a reason for hope. Um, <clears throat> now, I was telling you that these, uh, these are tetrameric complexes, and so GRIN1 variation and GRIN2B variations could impact the same receptor in the neuron. And so, for example, if you were to have a GRIN2B variation, these are just uh, uh, some of the kinds of complexes you could make. You might expect uh, this receptor in a neuron to be altered because you would have one copy of a variation, but other neurons can actually have two different uh, GRIN2 gene products, 2B and 2D, and so a child with a variation in GRIN2B would also change the function of this class of receptors. And here's another class of receptors where you have 2A and 2B, and so if you had a GRIN2B variation, you might also impact the 2A receptors. And you can play this theme out across all the GRINs. If you had a GRIN1 variation, you would also impact GRIN2B receptors. You would also impact the receptors with A and B, and you would impact the receptors with B and D. Uh, and even GRIN2A, you might think, well, that's a very separate, uh, intolerant but separate gene product. Even that's going to impact a subset of the receptors with GRIN2B. And so the point here is, I think, um, to take away is that these GRIN-related variants you might consider as a larger spectrum of GRIN-related disorders, where you would have GRIN1, GRIN2A, GRIN2B, GRIN2D, GRIN2C seems to be relatively tolerant, but there are families with GRIN2C uh, variation. And so I think a question for this family group as you move forward, and we've talked with some individuals about it, is just to think how can we leverage what we're doing here with the other parent groups that are now forming for GRIN2A and GRIN1 and, and try to uh, put our heads together, learn from each other, and, and catalyze the progress of, of understanding these disorders and trying to figure out how to, how to treat them. <clears throat> uh, so this is a summary. So we're just going to move a little bit into some metrics about the, what we understand about, about the, the GRIN variants. So this is a table uh, that we've put together with all of the information that's published in the academic peer-reviewed literature or information that's on government websites like ClinVar. And we have broken them out uh, by the GRIN gene, 1, 2A, B, C, and D. We've just picked a couple of uh, broad categories, ADHD, autism, epilepsy, uh, intellectual disability, slash uh, developmental delay. 
and uh, schizophrenia. Uh, and you can see for GRIN 2B, uh, we know of about 100 uh, variants that are in the literature. Uh, and, and some sort of report has been published and peer-reviewed by scientists, clinicians, or been deposited on, on the ClinVar website. Uh, and consistent with what Jennifer was saying, about a quarter of those, maybe a third of those, have uh, some sort of seizure disorder. The main phenotype is a developmental delay or intellectual disability. <clears throat> in addition to those um, total in the Grin family of 258, we know of maybe another hundred that are not yet published. These are parents who've contacted us, clinical colleagues who've contacted us, data that we've pulled out of the Emory uh, genetics database, and we're working on um, getting those into the literature and getting them onto a website so that uh, we have a comprehensive list. Uh, I think a, a, a really important question that we try to answer and, and can only do back of the envelope calculations at this point is how many of these patients are out there. And so Liz said when you got your diagnosis, they said maybe there's 10 of these out there. Uh, there's, there's actually going to be quite a bit more than that, although it will never be anything other than a rare disease. We're not going to run into the many hundreds of thousands, but there are quite a bit more than 10. And so here's how we begin to do those calculations. So for example, we, we, we started with some calculations on the GRIN 2A variants. There was a, a, a handful of papers published in 2013 with some really detailed metrics, at least in the context of epilepsy. And they had categorized quite high prevalence of epilepsy and of GRIN 2A variants in certain kinds of epilepsies, uh, centrotemporal spikes, uh, spike wave during slow wave sleep, uh, and uh, idiopathic focal epilepsy. And some of these percentages, 4, 18 percent, 8 percent, were pretty high. And if you take those numbers as representative and you multiply them by CDC numbers of children with these different conditions, uh, you, been to, you begin to come up in the GRIN 2A world, you know, of a couple thousand patients at least with some sort of epilepsy condition. And then if you go back and you look across our published data, you realize three quarters of the patients with a GRIN 2A variant have some form of seizure disorder, and so you can then begin to take that together, get an estimate for GRIN 2A. Um, we've also done that calculation another way. Uh, we're, this center that we are associated with, CFERV, uh, is, is becoming a clearinghouse for GRIN variants, all GRIN variants, including GRIN 3, GRIN 1. And we take everything we know, and if we plot it on a trajectory of how we're learning about things, you can, you can begin to estimate in, say, five years, if things continue to go as they are, how many grins might we see. There has not been any sort of decrement. They continue to increase as awareness grows outside of the major medical centers. And so when we do that sort of calculation, we get really rough estimates of maybe 5,000 grin variant patients uh, in North America. And we have a separate, uh, we have a separate series of um, information that we can do that calculation from, and it's from sequencing from China, where there are comprehensive programs to sequence, at least in the epilepsy uh, clinics, every pediatric epilepsy case that was not an acute uh, accident-induced uh, seizure. And when you take that sort of comprehensive evaluation, you can then take those numbers and just multiply them across you know, the number of cases in North America. And that also comes up in the, in the, in the you know, somewhere between three to 7,000. And so that's sort of our guess of the population in North America is something under 10,000. Um, so what would that translate? So here in Atlanta, we would expect there were to be 75 patients in Atlanta. Uh, and as I think Jennifer said, there's probably a lot of individuals who are maybe older and um, not at a point where the parents or that individual are gonna rush off and get sequencing. And so you know, we don't know how the older patients would look and we're not going to be able to capture those, but we should be able to capture everybody moving forward. So that's a rough, that's a rough idea of numbers. So how does that break out uh, here graphically for GRIN 2B and GRIN 2A? These, these are really uh, the lion's share of the variants. We have uh, 45 and 39 percent are GRIN 2A and GRIN 2B. So, you know, basically if I say there's 5,000, we're guessing 5,000, half of those should be a grin to be patient. Uh, and, and then these symptoms align with what Jennifer had showed you. Uh, the most common phenomenon is a developmental delay and uh, intellectual disability for grin to be, 
Uh, second most common is some sort of seizure disorder. So that's a little bit about the metrics. So what are we actually doing? So we've, we've been working on the GRINs uh, in a research context uh, in our laboratory since about 2012. And Hong Jai Yuan uh, did some of the first work on trying to figure out what do these variations do? The geneticists initially can give you your diagnosis and tell you there is a typo uh, in the writing of that genetic code or there's a termination in the code. Uh, when there's a typo, the question then becomes, what does it actually do to how the receptor works? I know there's a problem, but did the problem make my NMDA receptor work poorly? Or did it put it on steroids and supercharge it? Or did it send it to the wrong part of the neuron? Or did it make it arise in a cell that it shouldn't have been in and push it down in a cell that it should have been in. And so, so that's sort of a functional context. And so uh, our goals were really, you know, in order to catalyze basic and clinical research, we wanted to go and backfill this functional information on all the grins that are out there, the ones that are published, the new ones that are found. And the hope and the expectation was as we begin to take those, you know, hundreds and you know, in the future, thousands of variants, and we carefully describe what each one does to the function, there'll be a stratification for the clinicians, and they'll be able to say, well, you have, you know, an, a, a variation at arginine 1, 2, 3 to histidine, and we know what that does functionally. That makes the receptor work too well, and, and we know that there's these characteristics with this and this prognosis with this, and based on our empirical experience, we don't yet know how to fix that, but these medications don't work, and these medications do work. And so the, under, the, the hope was, as we, as we backfill that, there'll be a further stratification of the information that in the clinician's hands they'll be able to act on. And you know, I appreciate all of your, your inspirational quotes. You know, it will take time. It will take time to collect that, and then the clinicians will take time to digest it, uh, to begin to look for patterns. But in, I, I think inevitably, when we have that information, uh, it'll stratify the patient population and give us an opportunity to figure out how to treat, uh, how to treat, how to treat smarter and how to how to have maximal effect <clears throat> with minimum harm. So you know, that's you know that's our first goal in our laboratory, basic research laboratory, not a clinical laboratory. Figure out what these th what these variants do. The idea would be ultimately it will help us predict prognosis and effective therapies and improve quality of life. Yes. Yeah, so I was using the word variant for de novo mutation. So these are de novo mutations. These are, these are missense mutations where there's a typo in the genetic code. It hasn't, and, and what we work on are not terminations of the code where now you know the gene is not made. We look on, we, we functionally look at how does the receptor work when it is fully made but one small part has been exchanged because of the change in the genetic code. And so that's what we call variant. And so, so it's a mutation. It's a mutation. Missense mutation. So um, before I get to that, a couple, a couple other goals would really be to think about right now, what can we do with FDA compounds? And there are a handful of compounds that are known to hit the NMDA receptor, and they, they, some of them are safe in children. Uh, and some of those have been used. And have had benefit, and other times they have not had benefit. And so one of our goals is to expand what we know about the available compounds that could be used in a patient and do it in a way that's specific for the actual variant. And it's a slow process, but for example, the FDA library of brain penetrant compounds might be 3,000, I think it's 3,150. Ideally, we'd like to test every single one of those against every single mutation or variant and find out are any special that now act only on the mutant. Uh, we're not able to do that yet, but what we have done, are pi we're starting pilot studies where we pick maybe 100, a tractable number, and push it across a couple dozen of these mutations in different places of the GRIN genes, GRIN2B, GRIN1, GRIN2A, and ask is there a different pattern with how they work, and, or do they continue to work? Some of these mutations actually render some of these compounds like memantine totally ineffective because the mutation occurs at the place memantine binds. And that child would not be helped at all because the memantine would not actually bind in its pocket. And so one of the things we're talking about and trying to gear up and do 
are, are these proof of concept studies to show that this, this precision medicine actually has merit and that's necessary in this you know, marathon to then convert, convert, uh, convince funding agencies, hey, we want, to, we want to get the robots, the expensive robots running to screen the FDA library. We think it'll work because we saw stuff in our hundred where some are much better than others and so we think there's a benefit in that. So that's one of the things that we think about. Um, we tend to think right now about repurposing drugs uh, because systematically exploring uh, FDA drugs in prospective trials is challenging and so we want to look at things that we know are safe in children. We can make a case that they have utility and then the clinician in their judgment can choose whether or not they think it's of, of, of benefit to do it off label. And so that's where we are and I think Tim will have a chance to speak to that uh, in, in his presentation. We're also in the process of developing animal models where we create a mouse that harbors a mutation. And so I'm aware of two of these, two of these animal models that exist. I guess I found about, about a third one last night. Um, I know that there's a fourth one being made and we're in, we have seven more, six or seven more that we're in the process of having made. Once we have those animals, you have the ability to do many, many experiments. You can go in at the cellular level and ask what happened. What happened to the connections I showed you on the first slide? You can go to the behavioral level and say, does this one change in this animal produce what would be the equivalent of a seizure or a developmental delay in the animal or an inability to socialize correctly? Uh, and you can also ask, are, are there key developmental windows, uh, which I think is a crucial topic, for example, early in life at which the body tries to compensate for that problem and maybe in compensating at age six months, it creates more problems than it solves. Whereas if you could somehow get that individual past that window and, and you know, with the drug therapy, uh, and it then compensates at year eight, maybe it does not create those problems. Because the brain is plastic. It's always trying to change and it has the ability to change differently, you know, early in life. And we all think of our children. We know we all change dramatically. And so the, the developmental programs that are being executed are very, very different. And so those animals would allow us to start asking questions, you know, are there critical windows? If we could get this animal past that window, would things be much better? Uh, and then, of course, you can do rescue pharmacology in the animal. If the animal has seizures, you can go back and say, well, in a dish, you know, with a robot or a lot of hard work, um, I found two of these 100 compounds that actually look really interesting. What do they do to the animal? Uh, and so we're in the process of doing that. And it's, it's going to be slow. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a slow process. It's not six months, it's not one year, it's a, you know, a multi-year effort. Okay, so um, a lot of this work goes on through this center, Center for Functional Evaluation of Rare Variants, where, uh, let me tell you a little bit about this and then I'll come back to the, the question about uh, different regions of the um, protein or, or gene potentially being harmful. Um, the goal of this uh, center is really to catalyze the backfilling of the information, but also to pass that information back to the parents, back to the clinician, and put it on a publicly searchable website. And um, I'd encourage you to go to the website and look. It's a little bit science heavy, but you know, I think it's worth digging in and feel free to email questions. But we have a database where we're trying to catalog every single Grin variant as soon as we become aware of it to put it on there. Uh, updating that database maybe quarterly. And then as we begin to do our own experiments and assess this function that I was telling you about, we try to then upload that function prior to publication in the literature so that it's freely available to a clinician or a parent. If they just get that diagnosis, they can go to that table and perhaps actually another individual somewhere in the world has had that diagnosis, we got a hold of it, made the DNA, ran the functional analysis, and there's actually, there may actually be function for some of those. And so that's the goal. Uh, of the center. So this is a slide I was thinking might, might handle your question. So, so when, that, when CFERV uh, gets a request from an individual or a clinician, hey, we found this variant, looks interesting, are you guys, what do you guys think about it? The very first thing we do is ask, is it in the general population? And we go to this uh, Broad database, the Nomad database, and we look. And, and this is a, they call this a lollipop plot of human mutations uh, in the GRIN2B gene uh, in the healthy population. And these ones in blue are changes in the genetic code that actually change the protein structure. 
These ones in gray are changes that do not change the protein structure. And I know Tim will go into a little more detail about those synonymous uh, mutations versus uh, missense mutations. <clears throat> so that's the first thing we do. And, and the high likelihood is if, if your variation, if your mutation is actually found somewhere in the world, in the general population, that's probably not the cause of why the patient turned up in the clinic. It could be a contributing factor, but it's probably not the sole cause. So that's the first thing we do. And if it turns out your variation, uh, your mutation, de novo mutation, missense mutation, is one of these red dots, and it's not in the normal population, that, that's our very first indication that, yes, we're interested in that. We'd like to know what that actually does. And when you plot those across this linear representation of the gene, you find something pretty amazing. And, and this is actually one of the first papers that, that demonstrated what the geneticists had always predicted, which is a regional variation where the mutations that actually you would expect you find to cause disease turn up in regions in the healthy population where there are no variations. And so here's a stretch right here where uh, nobody that's been sequenced before ever has a variation. Whenever you do have a variation, you turn up in a clinic with some sort of neurological symptom. Uh, and so when we get these variants not in the database and they turn up in the hot spots, then they go to the top of our list because we want to know, you know what, do those, what do those variations do. So does that answer your question? You're saying where is the mutation? Okay. Uh, and so here is, a, here is a ribbon structure of that X-ray crystallographic uh, image I showed you earlier. And what I've done here is um, GRIN 2B is in blue, GRIN 1 is in gold, and in purple or magenta are the regions that are absolutely intolerant in the healthy population. And so you can see how complicated this problem is. Here is a piece of that machine winding up through the part that grabs glutamate, a clamshell, that uh, nobody, none of us in this room probably, and nobody who has been evaluated has any variation. And so very likely if your variants come into here, uh, they're very likely to cause problems. And you can see other parts. Here is that, here is that uh, cylinder that the, that the current flows through. All of that is absolutely critical. So these are the regions that, um, that these variations that are going to cause problems turn up in. <clears throat> okay, so what do we do functionally? And um, someone tell me if I start getting, getting, getting close. Okay, so, so we do functional analysis. We do electrical recordings. I'm not going to show you those recordings, but you know, happy to go into more detail offline. Uh, we basically do an electrical recording, and we, and we try to measure um, everything we can about what this protein does. And so, for example, these blue regions bind to the neurotransmitter glutamate, and so we want to make a measurement of how well the mutant receptor binds glutamate. Does it, does it bind it super tight all the time? Very low concentrations now activate it uh, when they shouldn't? Or has it lost the ability to bind? And now the protein looks just fine, but glutamate doesn't go into its spot so the channel never gets activated. Uh, so we'll do those kind of functional uh, measurements. We'll also measure, for example, uh, variations down in these orange regions, which is that channel that controls the current. And we'll try to ask the question, when this channel opened, does it now, does this pour pass current all the time? Does it pass a lot more current than it really should? Uh, and we'll also look at variation sometimes out in this region, which was the top of that receptor, because that has all kinds of neuromodulators that the brain uses to subtly control receptors. So we have a whole series of assays, about seven or eight assays. We measure all of those things, because to figure out uh, how this channel works, you really need to know all that. Um, we, there's another large part of the protein that hangs down in the cell. Uh, we're fortunate that Catherine is here today, world, world's expert on all the things that does on the inside, and she's going to tell you after lunch about um, how variation down in here is important for function. So uh, one or two summary slides, and I'm done. Um, so what does CFERV do? We have NIH funding to, to look at about 35 patients a year. Doesn't sound like very many. We, very many. We've leveraged that. Uh, we have some philanthropic donations to expand that number. We pride that information back to the clinic. The clinician, the family, the research community. 
Our goal is uh, to begin to organize the disparate literature in one place for parents, for researchers, for clinicians, so that there is a single site at which you can get this detailed information. We're trying to merge our database with the European databases, try to avoid at all costs duplication of effort, and you know, move towards comprehensive you know, single databases that are hosted at multiple sites. Uh, so in summary, just to finish, uh, I think personally we have, to, we have to think about this functional evaluation. It's the only way to make headway and stratify our patients after we get the genetic information. It inevitably will guide treatment st strategies. Um, to evaluate these mutations is really complex and it has to be comprehensive. I showed you, you know, the blue, the orange, and the green. If I were to take a shortcut and just measure one of those and say, well, this, this mutation makes glutamate no you know, bind too well, I think this receptor is overactivated, and I do nothing else, I could be completely wrong because Catherine might come and look at it and say, you know what, it does bind glutamate really well when it works, but it never goes to the surface of the neuron. So in fact, you think it improves function, but in reality, it decreases function. And so we have to look at this comprehensive evaluation of all the different things. Uh, and then we're moving towards animal models. You know, can we recapitulate patient properties? Can we find critical time? Can we test rescue pharmacology? And all of this is sort of a prelude to trying to, you know, think about down the road fixing the problem. <clears throat> So what can you guys do? I think it's important to have a conversation in your group with other groups. How do you combine forces, uh, maximally leverage your energy, their energy? Uh, this is, these are very similar problems. It's the same receptor. Every GRIN1, every GRIN2B receptor in your body has a GRIN1 gene product connected to it. I think that's critical. I think uh, you're already connecting with other foundations and learning from them. I was really inspired by your introduction, by the way, to put the effort in and um, you know, see what other people have done as motivation to get moving. Uh, you wanna be proactive in supporting research, not just, not just here and with your clinician nationally. You wanna let our legislature know that priority, research priority is important. Uh, and you want to connect with, even though I can't really understand how complicated your lives are, you still, I, I still would wanna encourage you to, comp to connect with everybody who's trying to trying to collect and bring this information together, uh, even though it means more questionnaires, because we, we have to put the information together, and Tim will talk a little bit more about this, to really convince, to, to, to attract other individuals into the field, to convince NIH that this is worth effort. This is not just one, two, or five people. This is a problem that we'll learn a lot from. And so you know, we can only do that as the information rolls into the literature and peer-reviewed evaluation of not 10 or 5 patients, but hundreds of patients. Here's, here's what they look like, here's their prognosis, here's the problem. And that requires you guys, you know, to get involved. <clears throat> That's it.